said our speaker this afternoon is Professor John Clarkson. John is Director of the Cambridge Engineering Design Centre, Professor of Engineering Design at the University of Cambridge and Professor of Healthcare Systems at the Technical University of Delft. He's uh, uh, Director, as I say, of the Engineering Design Centre, one of the largest centres of engineering design research in the world. John is also one of the most prolific design researchers in our community, has worked in process management, change management, inclusive design, healthcare design, automotive design, amongst other areas. And he's uh, published very, very widely. He's been a member of the Design Society since the first conference that it ran in 2003. And he was a member of its advisory board from uh, that date for the maximum po possible time of 12 years. John's going to be speaking to us uh, in a moment, tell you about his career, tell you about some of the directions he's followed. Um, then after that, we will open up to a question and answer session. So please, if you would like uh, any question posed to John Ross from the Design Society, and I will be watching the uh, conversation space. Uh, if you look on your team's uh, menu bar, the third from the right, at least on mine, says show conversation. If you click on that, you will be able to post questions to us all. We will be watching those. And when John has finished his short presentation, uh, we will be looking through that for questions to post to him and to uh, fire off discussion. I'm very much looking forward to what John has to say, and I'm very much looking forward to hearing what your questions are. John, if I may, I'll hand over to you and uh, welcome from us all. Thanks, Chris. Thank you very much for the introduction. I'm going to speak, I hope, for around about 12 minutes, and I'll try and keep it to that so we can then talk about more general issues that will be important at the end. It is a reflection. I'm going to say things that maybe people don't know about me. I'm probably not going to say a lot about the things you do know about me, but I'll make a few comments along the way, not so much about the detail of the research, but what I think about the research looking back. So I'm going to share my screen and you should be able to see the presentation there. So a career in engineering design. So then two questions, how can we do it better and what could possibly go wrong? And you'll see the relevance of those questions later. But first, a bit of a potted history. I was really privileged enough to go to school in, down in Somerset and Wells Cathedral School. My, my Sorry, school, John, I, it seems like your audio's maybe cut out a little bit there. I'll get even closer to the mic. I hope the internet's not suffering. So can you hear me again now? Is that clear? Yep, sounds good now. So we'll, we'll try again. So I, I was privileged to go to school down in Wells in Somerset, and my schoolhouse was in this medieval street, and it was a music school. So I spent probably three hours a day doing music, but became fascinated by math at a very early age. And that led pretty directly into a, a career in engineering. And my first work between school and university was working for the English Electric Valve Company. And I got fascinated by these physical, architectural, electrical, electronic devices. The, the Klystron on the right is about four foot tall and is responsible for TV broadcast. The, the thing on the, the left hand side, about eight inches long, and it was a camera tube for a broadcast camera. I got fascinated by the architecture of these things. And from there, I went on to, to Cambridge and studied general engineering for two years and then electrical engineering and then did a PhD in stepping motors. And my job was to investigate that gap in the torque speed curve right on the right hand side. And say, well, why is it that you get no torque at some of the high speeds? I spent 18 months trying to find that second equation. It nearly was the death of me in terms of research and what I learned from that was not the math was difficult, but you needed to picture what these equations meant. So a lot of my time was then spent trying to convert those two equations to these two pictures and translate what I saw in those pictures as to why the motor was unstable. And in essence, if you look at the graph on the right, the thicker green line where it crosses the shaded red area is where the motor goes unstable. And I spent in the end three years trying to show that that was the case. And it was a sort of precursor, that insight, to some of the knowledge that's now required for electric vehicles and the drives used within them. After that, I then went to work in this extraordinary building south of Cambridge, the Richard Rogers building. 
and it's PA Technology, the consulting firm. And I worked on a very wide range of things for about seven and a half years. And a couple of the highlights, I worked for the Royal Navy in the UK on a firefighter training system. This was the old system, steel container. You fill it, fill it full of flames from diesel and railway sleepers and you send the trainees in to fight fires. Not very repetitive. So we wanted to replace that with computer controlled flames. So my job was to architect the software and the electrical systems to control the burners. And if my software requested flames and everything was safe, we then would get flames. I was also fully responsible for the safety of that system. And as you can imagine, you've got a big store of propane gas in a tank through a bundle of pipework and valves to a burner. And I had to learn how to do the risk assessments to ensure that that would be safe. And in the end, we actually had to add some guardrails to make sure that for the bigger fires, we could stop people falling on the flames. The system that came out of it has now been developed further and embodied in I think three units around the UK where naval firefighters learn how to fight fires in artificial computer controlled environments. I also worked on some other rather more important projects like how do you get keg quality beer in a can? You remember this was probably over 25 years ago now and I got involved in a complex project trying to understand what the widget would be that goes in the can, how you'd put it in there and how you keep the workers safe when you've got a lot of nitrogen in the atmosphere and it's easy to kill the workers. I also did a lot of med tech work and got involved in the delivery of all sorts of different devices. And one project, for example, was putting a computer inside this discus inhaler so we could monitor people's conformance to their required practice. And I guess all those years of practice, a couple of things came out of it. The first was those two questions that I put up at the beginning. I guess I realised that engineering was really all about how can we do it better and what could possibly go wrong? And it's the dynamic balance of being able to answer those questions, I think, was what makes a good engineer. But part of the reason I then went back to university was that I really realised it's all about the process. The way we think about, the way we deliver design is of paramount importance. And I guess you learn that by working in technology consulting. So I went back to university and Chris has mentioned some of the areas I worked in. And I'm just going to give you a snapshot of each one, one or two of the things that I learned coming out of them. So we did work on process management, inspired initially by Westland helicopters. I think out of that came a fascination of pictures of design. So that the naval architecture design spiral the architects designed squiggle and then we started drawing our own pictures of how we'd capture processes and how we capture the feedback and the feed forward in the process we've done a lot of work with design structure matrices in trying to understand what they tell you what they don't tell you what forms of analysis they enable and what they obscure and we started drawing pictures of design processes trying to figure out what that would tell us or not and behind it i guess i had this driving fascination that said, well, if we could look at the frequency of a performance after it, maybe the, the cost of a design process, if we understood the process better, would we see the plan in front of us as part of a subset of a wider range of possibilities? And if so, could we find a better starting point within that set that would outperform where we started from? So that's been driving me from a long time, and I'm trying to figure out really the answer just to one question. And that is what is the optimal process to design an adequate product with the premise that I think very few processes are optimal. Was that work strategic? Um, what I mean by that is I plan to work in this space from the point I went back to university 25 years ago. Was it opportunistic? Um, absolutely it was. Um, the first PhD student who worked with me was given to me by the head of department second hand. He happened to work for Westlands. So that strange mix of wanting to work in the area, but a lot of the work we've done has been very opportunistic based on people wanting to work with us. We've done a lot of work in change management about complex systems and processes and how they're connected together. Um, Claudia Eckhart's spent a long time working and still does on change. 
mechanisms? Are there ripples of change? Are there avalanches of change? I've spent a lot of time looking at the algorithms that might try and predict how change ripples through complex systems and how we might map those methods, starting with DSMs, showing the connectivity and converting that to a probabilistic DSM, showing the likelihood and impact of things being connected. And most recently, this particular work I've taken into the world of policy making and government in showing you can capture multi domain matrices that actually reflect different areas of responsibilities and different decision outcomes in government. The purpose being we're trying to find obvious and less obvious connections between bits of government and things they do. And I guess the question I'm answering all the while is, is there an optimal architecture for a resilient system? And coming back to those two questions about intention, was this work strategic? No, I never intended to do this, but it came out of a single question from Westlands that prompted us to do 20 years work in this space. So again, it was opportunistic, but I had never planned to work in this space. And then a couple of things could really be quite different. Inclusive design, and really this was focusing more on the question on the, the left hand side, how do we do it better? And it was starting from the premise that it's normal to be different. We are all different in what we can and cannot do in our backgrounds and what we think. And we were inspired to say, well, how do we design to accommodate such a range? And we were inspired by people like Roberts who make radios. The one on the left there is the old analog radio. The one behind it to the right is a digital radio. They are deliberately very similar in the way they look and that encourages older users to be able to use the digital radio. And that's really important. One of the things we learned about good inclusive design, that it plays to people's mental models of how things should behave. We spent a lot of time building simple tools to help people empathize, to find out whether design is good or bad from different users' point of view. We've also spent a lot of time thinking about the process and published widely on the explore, create, evaluate simple model of design. And that's made it into the national curriculum in the UK. We have tools that we take out, which are now used in schools to teach people about good design that happens to be inclusive design. And more recently, we've applied this technique to what they call hero images, the, the images that you see online when you're trying to purchase things from the supermarket. You've got a, an original image on the left and the revised image on the right. And this tells you exactly what the product is and what the size is. And we've written international guidance on this now. And, and companies that follow this find there are fewer mistakes when people pick their product. And actually they make more money because people find it easier to find their product. The key question here is what does a good inclusive design process look like? And I think that's the common ground through all that work. Again, was it strategic? I never set out to work in that area, but 20 years ago I was asked to go to a meeting by the UK Design Council. I met a professor from the Royal College of Art and from that point on we collaborated for about 14 years. And again, it was opportunistic. It was around the companies and the people who would fund us. BT funded us for a long time, Unilever and others. They've all come to us with opportunities for us to do things. Then the last one quickly is healthcare design. And right from the outset from my time at PA, I had this fascination with how would we do better design in healthcare or improvement? And I think it probably comes from the fact I always thought I should have been a doctor, but trained as an engineer. And you could start from the engineering premise that systems at work do not just happen, they have to be planned, designed and built. And yet that's not the healthcare system I know of, which sort of evolves. And we got more and more interested in medical devices, in risk. And about 14 years ago, the chief medical officer asked us to work on a project on design for patient safety to figure out how design could assist in making patients safer. And we pretty much said you need to take a systems approach. And then five years ago, I was asked by the Royal Academy of Engineering to lead a working group to develop a systems approach to health and care design and continuous improvement, which we then called engineering better care. And what we did is very simply say there are different perspectives 
through which you can look at a systems approach. It's about people, systems, design and risk. And we had long conversations with healthcare professionals, out of which came a series of questions. And we put this process together built around questions, which, which helps people start to think about a systems approach, even if they have no training in that area. We put a bit of a process around that, about understanding the context, defining the problem, develop the solution, collect the evidence, make the case, manage the plan, and ultimately agree the scope. So with all that thinking has now been about how do we take engineering design systems thing into health and care? With the core question about, well, what does a good health systems improvement process look like? Was this strategic? Well, yes, it was. It, this, I've been determined to do this work ever since I went back to university. It's been a large part of what I've been trying to achieve and probably the main focus of the work that I now do. Was it opportunistic? Uh, not in the slightest. We've had to work extraordinarily hard to get funding in this area because it, it sort of falls between all the different stools. So reflecting on what can we do better, what could possibly go wrong? I'll pick out just a few things. I've been very fortunate to be in Cambridge for all this time, surrounded by very smart students. It's not difficult to recruit people to come and work with you. And um, that's been a massive benefit in all the work we've been trying to do. And, and companies like to come and work with Cambridge. We have a good reputation. You have to work hard. Um, I've never worked harder than when I've been an academic. I thought I worked hard in industry. I've never worked harder than when I've been an academic. And to succeed, I sense that's what you need to do. Unfortunately, I think that's what you need to do. That said, it's actually all about the team. One of the key things that's been so important in my research group is it is all about the team. It's about the people around you, the students, your other colleagues. That's where the focus should be, not on what you think you can do on your own. Chris said I was very prolific. Well, yes, but that's about the team and it's about nurturing bright people to do things and run alongside you. There's another part of that, and that's about the network. From very early on, I determined that it was important to get to know people outside of your group, in other groups, in other domains, in industry, in the hospital. I cannot underplay the importance of that networking. I've spent 25 years trying to get to know the local health economy in and around Cambridge, and boy, is it bearing fruits now that my main focus is on healthcare. I'm involved with a lot of people in the local hospital. I'm, I'm one of the governors for the local hospital. And that took 25 years of effort to get to that point where I can now do the things I want to do. And one of the final things, it, it's not just about research. I think if I look back, I have been driven throughout my career actually by impact, not research, by wanting to make things happen, wanting to deliver change. To do that, you've, you've got to do good research and you need to do good education, the right opportunities for education, both within the university and without, to deliver the impact. And I think that triumvirate is really important to have a, a really brilliant team around you to deliver world class impact through world class research and good education. And I'd like to stop at that point and open for questions. And if I can, I will. Put the screen back. Thank you very much indeed, John. That was that was excellent. Somebody, the, I mean, the first question says, "Dear Professor Clarkson, thank you for your amazing presentation." Uh, I can't thank say you. better than that. Uh, Yaroslav mentioned him. Um, he says, being a young researcher, just completed his PhD under Prof Ed Crawley's supervision. He has a very practical question for you. You've worked in an engineering consultancy for seven and a half years after your PhD. Sorry if I heard it incorrectly. How did that affect your future research studies and in what way? What do you think? What would you have done differently should you go to postdoctoral research directly after your PhD? And uh, I mean, I, I've got a comment I'd like to make after that, but uh, I'm very interested to hear your view. Would you have done something differently if you'd gone straight to postdoctoral work after your PhD? That's a great question and I did try and get a, a junior research fellowship and I have to remind two of my previous heads of department about this because they interviewed me for a junior research fellowship and they did not give it to me. 
<laughs> and I then went to work with them. Um, it was probably the best thing that ever happened for me personally that I didn't pursue stepping motor research. I went into industry and I guess I learned how to be an engineer. And that that was superlative and it helps you in your teaching with the students. It helps make sense of the research you try and do. I think I was very fortunate because when I came back to the university, I had zero track record in research and design, but I had acted as a designer, but I had a my first head of department wanted somebody for that post who had worked in design. He himself had come from industry to come back to university. So I, I struck very, very lucky. But I do think I was very fortunate to have that time in industry to work on as a basis for being learning about research. But as Chris was knows, only I think three years ago, I finally got a qualification, a higher degree in engineering design. So it's taken me a long time to get there. Yeah, I, I mean, if I can just bring in a personal note there, I I came into the university system in the mid 80s and in Britain at that time, there was a number of us recruited into universities straight from industry without having done higher degrees. I think it was assumed then we were going to concentrate on teaching. And I mean, I, I know it was inordinately difficult, very difficult uh, in the first few years to work out what direction we might go in. but. Conversely, I think a group of people who did come in from industry into engineering design research in the 80s did set the early direction. Now, the question was whether they set the right direction or not. I don't know. I'd be interesting in retrospect to look at it. Um, can I remind anybody who has questions for John, please to pose them, uh, put them through the chat room and that there are um, if people want to speak directly, just put your hand up. There's a raise your hand button on the toolbar at the bottom. If you raise your hand, we'll try and watch and uh, you can speak directly to John if you'd like to. Uh, John, could I say um, you, you, you use the words team networking, but also whether something strategic or reactive. Um, just while I'm watching the other questions coming in, do you think you've become more or less as strategic as you've gone along? Was it a case of the early days you had to be reactive and you've been able to become more strategic? I think there was a desire to, to be able to sustain the group and develop its, its areas of interest. And when people came to you with an interesting challenge, it's very tempting to jump on and say, yes, I should do that. But for those of you who remember Ken Wallace, Ken, you always used to say to me, John, you're doing too many different things. You have to cut down. And one of the last things I ever said to Ken was that I am focusing now on healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think there's a right or wrong answer to this. I have learned over the years that my focus on process and change in engineering has been instrumental in some of the conversations I now have in healthcare. I think the shift has actually been more from detail to strategy or systems and strategy. So I worry less about medical devices. I worry more about medical delivery systems. I do more work now on policy, but with the privilege of coming with a design thinking hat or a systems thinking hat and trying to help people design what they do. So I think that's where if I've been determined to do anything, it's been more to go in that direction. And I only think I can do that because I've had that spread of experience early in the career that I have worked in industry. So I have that credibility in front of people in government. I've done enough in healthcare that I have credibility in front of the CEO of a hospital trust. So I think as you get further on in your career, you, you get more freedom and therefore you can be more strategic and do the things you want. It's very difficult early on that there is a sense you have to chase the things you're expected to do to get yeah. on. Yeah, very good. There, there, there are two questions in the queue. Um, there's somebody with their hand up, but I'll go first to the one which was uh, posed first as a Jess Jessica Artilas. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. She says, Prof Clarkson, that was a treat. Thank you. I'm a designer in inverted commas coming from MIT Mechie and now sitting on the board and consulting MIT's sweet global co-creation lab. If you could close your eyes and manifest a new design based innovation entity in healthcare, a hub out of MIT, what would some key elements be? What would you make sure to include or watch out for? Oh, that's that's okay. really interesting. So we, we are dreaming along those lines, uh, Jessica, in the sense that before COVID struck, we just opened an outlet of engineering and part of my lab on the hospital site. 
And part of the reasoning and thinking there is that what we're trying to achieve is a crossover between engineering and, and healthcare. And particularly, we want to train healthcare improvers. We want to train up and coming medics. So the idea was to co-create a space where we could run projects for students. They might be medical students, they might be engineering students, but we wanted them to come together and focus on healthcare problems. And for me, that the dream would be that you have that lab, that forum where you can bring the same problem to a mixed team. And they may have different ways of looking to different pedagogies, different mechanisms by which they learn, but how do we bring them together? Now I play that out in my research group anyway. So we take first year clinical medics. So they've done their university training, they're doing their professional training. They come and work with us for eight weeks at a time. But half of my research team in healthcare are clinicians. And that's so at the research level, half my postdocs are clinicians. Now you can imagine the quality of the conversations you have over coffee are quite different than if you're surrounded just by engineers. So for me, the thing that makes the biggest difference out of anything is to be surrounded by engineers and medics at the same time. And it transforms the conversations you can have. It transforms the problems and challenges you see on both sides. And it just un it just changes the way you look at the world and the questions you ask of it and the research you want to do. OK, are you happy with that, Jessica? I was trying to unmute. Yeah, that's really great. It's actually funny, Professor Clarkson. Of course, that's that's so brilliant. The, the medics would be some of the users in the system, right? We actually, this hub in particular, and we can take some of this conversation offline, but this hub in particular is going to be uh, collaborating with the Miami. So it's an MIT and Miami double pillar approach, mm -hmm. thinking that Miami, uh, leveraging Miami's innovation healthcare systems and other hospitals, well, at least pre COVID. And, and then MIT is sort of science innovation. Yeah. So it's interesting because the populations are so different. That yeah. communicating across those cultures is about setting design principles that can guide both sides and not feel, feeling any one of them left out, right? Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think it is about not necessarily having a common language, but being able to understand each other. I mm -hmm. think that's the key thing. And you only get that by spending time with people. And I say it's taken me a long time to get that point, but I think getting people in the same shared space, enjoying spending time in their company is the starting point. Uh, the engineering students love it, that they get something out of it way beyond their colleagues in other en engineering technical disciplines. But I think you have an opportunity at MIT to have the so-called golden triangle because you have the Boston Hospital and other things you can link in. So I think a delivery system for healthcare as being part of it is really important as well. Right. Right. Yeah, we'll keep that in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Jessica. Uh, uh, there's a, a Sujithra had a hand up, but I noticed it's gone down. Uh, would you like to say something if I pronounce that correctly, Sujithra? Yes, that's absolutely right. Thank you so hey. much. Thank you. Uh, hi, Prof Clarkson. I have hi. been following your work for past six years, ever since I started to work on inclusive design. They have inspired me a lot, and at times they answer the questions I have and make me push even further. So my research looks into a systematic application of inclusive design perspectives, especially for medical device design. Uh, moving forward after my PhD, I would like to work on healthcare systems design. I would like to know how do I prepare myself for a postdoc in healthcare systems design, since I don't have a systems design perspective. That's that's a very good question. I think I think there are two elements to the answer. One is you have to understand the healthcare system itself and I think that has always a unique local structure to it as well. And we know all around Europe each system is quite different from the other but you do need to understand the system you want to influence and have people you can talk to within that system. I think from the engineering side there's a variety of sources to, to gather information about a systems approach, systems engineering, systems thinking they are different things they are designed for different purposes but i think having a broad knowledge of the elements of systems mapping risk management creativity you have the people bit through inclusive design but i think you do need to understand what people are talking about in those areas and we've been influenced quite a lot by service design as well which clearly crosses over into that space the thing i would say though it's quite important to hang on to the essence of what is good engineering good rigorous thinking because i think that's the bit that 
you can offer most. And when we talk to clinicians and care providers about their challenges, and we explain what we're thinking about, where we're coming from, the design and creativity part, part jumps out of the page. The risk part, what could possibly go wrong, jumps out of the page. And surprisingly, the other thing is the stakeholder analysis. That breadth of saying, oh, you thought there were six people here. Well, it's probably about 36 and we haven't finished yet. And the, the depth at which you can start, try and understand the stakeholders. So I think don't lose sight of what you think and believe as a, an engineer or product designer, because that is the bit they, they don't necessarily understand and can seed all sorts of very interesting conversations. I think the other thing I would say is that you're not there to give them the right way of doing things. You're there to run with them to influence the way in which they do things from where they, they're starting from. So I think it's always a big mistake to go and think, I know the right answer. I know how you should be doing this, which is partly why we end up with a lot of questions in the work we've done. We go on with a bunch of questions. We know how we might answer them, but we're interested to see how they might and then work with them to do that. So I think you don't need a complete understanding of systems, but I think you need an appetite and a sufficient understanding to know what it's about to start those conversations. I agree. Thank you so much. I have a biomedical engineering background. I guess I will uh, work more with healthcare professionals to get the grasp of it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sujithra. John, the, the, the S word has come up a lot. Systems. I, I can remember uh, a few years ago uh, in the ICED uh, conference, we originally had a, a, a particular theme of the conference on product design and we added systems to it that do you think the community has gone far enough in recognizing the importance of systems or is there well, further to go generally in that respect that's a difficult thing chris i think part of that's personal in how you view the world i i just think of everything as a system but i've yeah. been steeped in it too long and i think whatever product you think you're looking at it resides in a system um so that way of thinking of the world and the system of systems and the, the supply system, it helps to think in that way to, be able to take a broad enough view. Um, but what some people call a product, others will call a system and vice versa. So I, I don't think I'd want to stamp my view on anybody else's territory, but for me, it is about systems. And I think the other thing to, if you go back through the ICEDs that we spotted was the word change appeared, I think back in Munich and what that was all about was saying that actually a lot of design is by variation and change rather than starting from a blank sheet of paper. And that was seemed to be a revolution to our community or we hadn't spotted it before, hadn't used the right language. Yeah. I think that is dominant in, in my world in healthcare and policy that you're always starting from something. Yeah. So I think it's, it's quite interesting to sort of deflect from your question a little bit to think more about improvement as well as design and think about change as well as doing something novel and new. But whether you talk about product or service, I think you can always go abstract enough from a product to see a system or service or policy or something else. So I, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't get hung up on it, but it is all about systems, to be frank. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Uh, I noticed the Design Society admin, Ross, I presume you want to say something. You have your hand up, is that correct? Yeah, I've got a quick question um, that I can come in with. Um, so when I started my PhD, I noticed, um, well, probably about the middle, I noticed actually I wasn't very aware of everything that had happened in design, the research that had taken place. And so I was able to build up my knowledge within the area that I was investigating. Um, but there's so much more out there and, and processes and methods and things. So something that I'm really interested in now is trends in design and uh, over the years and, and where design research is heading. Um, so uh, I, I noticed you were involved with uh, a report on design 2040. Where do you think from your perspective design is moving towards? Oh, that's probably the most difficult question so far. It's really interesting because if you read proposals for research in this area, everybody tells you the world's getting more complicated. And therefore, we need more sophisticated tools and techniques to try and understand the world to be able to change it. I don't think we can always use that argument, but I still think we don't really understand 
answer some of the basic questions. And that's partly why I put the four questions up about my research. Because when I look back, one of the invariants in my my personal world is that what is the optimal process to deliver an adequate product? Well, that question hasn't changed. But the nature of the product, the interconnectedness of the product, the scope of the product might have, might have changed. So I'm, I'm more personally in favour of sticking to some of the underpinning fundamental questions, which I don't think we fully understand the answers to yet, and saying, well, we can ask a nuanced version of that question because the technologies and the physical world around us has changed. We are more connected than ever before. We used to inhabit the electromechanical world, and a lot of the early references and text were, were steeped in that. Now, it's not the same, but in a sense, I think we're still trying to play catch up. And the thing I would caution against, too, is that I think it's very easy to get caught out with thinking that we as design researchers are the people who should be able to find the answers. And I'll give you one example of that, that we did a project with Jaguar Land Rover, and we were looking at the integration of information within their complex design process. And I have to say, within a couple of meetings, I realised that I think there was probably maybe one or two academics in the whole of the UK who could actually understand what Jaguar Land Rover were talking about. And not just talking about the problem, but the architectures of the solutions and tools that they already use to drive their research forward. So I think there's a, we have to be so careful as researchers that we don't try and answer the questions that industry is already answering because they will be way ahead of us. And it is a, a mean, mean, we need to sort of back off a bit and say, look, what's the underlying question, which might be about quality or rigor or resilience, that it's too long term for them to try and address, and they may be not looking at it, but we should be looking at it. So I don't think the trends, apart from tracking the, the use of technologies in design, have changed very much. One thing I would say, though, and I think COVID is, has really shown this up, is the issue of resilience. And I think that's one of the best words that's coming to the English language around design research. We used to talk about robustness and thought that's enough. And then the word resilience came in, which was robustness plus flexibility and adaptability. Yeah. And that is something I think we should be chasing really hard to understand what that means at multiple levels and how we architect systems and how we design products to be resilient. And it doesn't mean to say we have to design them all to be robust or all to be flexible. It, it's whatever combination fits. And I think COVID has shown that the world we inhabit, and particularly the health service, is far more flexible than we ever believed. And partly because it's about people who can repurpose and retrain. There's more flexibility hidden there than we thought. It's partly that we are incredibly creative when we have to be. So I, I thought about this before I came online and my answer was was going to be, I think, if we want to focus on anything that could have real purpose going forward, I think it's about resilience and within that particularly flexibility. So we can be really fleet of foot when we see enormous changes coming through. When you think of the car industry now, back to Jaguar Land Rover, they have to be resilient as, as a business by thinking about, well, how do they deliver world class electric vehicles? Where a couple of years ago they knew nothing about what that meant. So I think I would step back and look at it and say, look, the, these are the issues to look at, but we may have a playground in which we, we do our research that is driven by particular technologies and technological trends. Very interesting. Thank, Thank you good. very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Ross, are you happy with that? Very good. Thanks. Uh, very that, uh, uh, th there's another um, question come up on the chat, John. Again, I hope I've pronounce this correctly, Jan Melstelbel. Uh, Dear Professor Clarkson, thanks a lot for taking the time. Since you're an expert on process models on the one hand, and you're talking about approaches such as inclusive design, what's your opinion on agile development in the domain of mechatronics? Do you think it's a meaningful approach that one has a importance in the future? That's quite topical. That's an interesting question because there's a parallel in healthcare and they have the IHI model of healthcare improvement mm -hmm. based around plan, do, study, act. And I think with all these processes which are trying to be agile, it really comes down to your competence in two things. One is understanding when they should be used. And the second is understanding how to use them well when they should be used. 
and I think these techniques have their place and can be really powerful if you have a system that lends itself to that approach without disadvantaging anybody or making the world unsafe for anybody. So I go to healthcare for the example, PDSA, Plan, Do, Study, Act, was designed for small scale change, much along the lines of an agile approach. And it works where it works because you try something, you put it in service, you measure how it performs, and if it doesn't work, you go and revisit it again. Now, that's fine for small things that create no harm to anybody. If you try it on big things and you get it wrong, it can be downright dangerous. And I think it's the same with Agile, that it has its place. It would be very, very effective at getting teams to, in a very dynamic way, address topics on a short time scale and really get things done. But it works best where an incremental approach is appropriate and is not going to cause harm or damage to the systems around what you're trying to develop. So I think all these things, I, I've, I'm quite critical about various techniques, but if they're used in the right way and they use well, they're very powerful. If they're abused, because it, everybody thinks, oh, this is the latest thing we should be doing, that's where there can be trouble. So I think in answer to your question, to answer it properly, if you not only understand the words that describe agile design, but the essence of what it is and how it should be used, you'll know when it's safe to use it. Mm -hmm. But you should also have the courage not to use it if you don't think it's the right thing to do. Very interesting, thank you. I, 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 could I quote one of my favourite quotes? This is from a, somebody called James March, and he was writing in Organisation Science in 1991. And he was writing about the study of adopt, adaptive processes. It said, a central concern of studies of adaptive processes is the relation between the exploration of new possibilities and the exploitation of old certainties. Exploration includes things captured by terms such as search, variation, risk taking, experimentation, play, flexibility, discovery and innovation. Exploitation includes such things as refinement, choice, production, efficiency, selection, implementation, and execution. And I think replace adaptive processes by engineering design and you have something exactly right. And it's what is the balance between exploring new possibilities, ex search for novelty and exploiting what we know already, refining, developing them mm. and so on. And I think understanding in any domain what the balance is and how it's changing with time is very important. Anybody? Oh, yes. There's uh, uh, Yaroslav mentioned in has got his hand up again. Yaroslav, please. Yes. Good to see I, you. I, good to see you too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I have the second question, if I may ask. And thank you again, Professor Clarkson. It's very, very interesting. Uh, and the question is the following. Um, uh, so we've been thinking about the optimization of the products over the last decades, right? How can we optimize the product in such a way that we can actually uh, deliver it in a good quality and with a lower possible price, uh, cost, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But what the COVID has, show, has shown us is that uh, we don't need to be to, to the products to be optimized all the time, right? Uh, because uh, the fact that we did not have the bats uh, in the healthcare system uh, actually caused lots of problems. So in this case, we have some kind of uh, controversial situation in which the optimization is not a good but bad word. So how can design and design science, design research uh, solve this problem in the future? Or how can we help uh, industry and healthcare system and other systems to solve this? Thank you. you. You sort of gave the answer in the beginning of your question. And it's really interesting because it's this engineer driven perspective that we want to make it better. We'd like it to be optimal. And then it's the commercial perspective that says, look, what do we need to do? What's good enough to be good as a business? And what's that trade off? So I think if we always think of optimal with regard solely to the product, we miss something. I think you've got to decide what is optimal, what is of most value to the system, which might be the company, it might be the, the greater society, it depends what your perspective is and how you're funded. And if you look at the different stakeholders and the different value judgments, you may take a different balanced view of what optimal looks like. 
But if we only focus on the product, I think we can get it wrong. And I think the example I like is that there's work being done out of Bristol by Stuart Burgess on bicycle chains. And he's been working on the team with Tony Pennell that's looking at bicycle chains for the Olympics. And you can say, well, if we could improve the efficiency of a bicycle chain by some small part of a percent, you can translate that into, say, four metres on the track at the end of a four kilometre pursuit. So you say, OK, so I know what I need to do. Do I release that advantage all at one time? Because that would give me the optimal solution. And you sort of think, no, you've got to double guess what's going on. You say, well, if I give the four metres all at one time, I'll win the gold medal. But I've got nothing in reserve. The competitors will catch up. So if I play the longer game, do I release two metres advantage for the first Olympics, but know how to get the next two metres for the next Olympics? And you, you take a much broader view of what success looks like. So I, I am genuinely frustrated by the idea of optimal. I always was. When I was in industry, it was the same thing. That When you're spending clients' money to develop something for them, it really is about the optimal process to get to the adequate product. If you were to try to charge a client for an optimal product, they couldn't afford it. And I guess having grown up in that technology consulting world, I was steeped in that commercial discussion that was going on around the product right from the beginning. I think that's probably pushed my thoughts in that direction. It has to be just good enough to you survive as a business or for you to, have to deliver the health care you need to deliver, or whatever it might be. That said, I should say, I do think there is space for us to understand how mathematically to do good optimization. It has its place in all sorts of ways. Absolutely. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yosla. Um, could I uh, give another of my favorite quotes, John? I know I'm yeah. hogging it here, but, but uh, from time to time, we all have people coming up to us who are struggling with their research, struggling to find direction and so on. And I sometimes recall it, I think it was Paul Nurse, the Nobel Prize winning geneticist. And he, I was hearing him on the radio once and he said when he has a researcher coming up, he says research is like being in a fog initially. You don't know what's around you at all. Mm. And gradually, very, very slowly, the fog begins to lift and things begin to come clear, but it never goes completely it, it, and it's always swirling around. You know, is there a, 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 a little aphorism you have for uh, cases where, where you're trying to uh, give people insight into the difficulty of research? I, I think it's a brilliant question, Chris, and I think there's two things I say. One is, I often say to folk, you need to learn to become comfortable in the fog. Yes. And I think that partly again comes from working in healthcare and in technology that you come into meetings and you know nothing about what they're talking about. And you can be that cheeky engineer who's the only engineer in, the, in the a room full of people who know what's going on. You keep asking questions, keep trying to figure out, well, is it this, is it that? And don't be afraid of proposing what you think is in the fog knowing that it might not be because everything you everything you say every prompt you make every picture you draw you get some response but you've got to be comfortable with the fact you don't know what's going on and at some point the fog will clear so i think learning to be comfortable in the fog is really important yeah the other thing i, I would often do when students feel that they can't quite get a handle on what it is they should be doing or how to describe it i turn it into a design problem and if it's down to the research questions, for example, I don't quite know how to articulate that question. So I say to them, look, every day you come into the office for the next three weeks, write down off the top of your head what three versions of what you think that question should be. Yeah. No reflection, write it down, stick it on the pile. And three weeks later, unpack it all and, and look at all the things you've written down and see if it helps you understand what's in the fog. So I think to be able to stand back and not worry too much and just be creative, come up with a whole variety of ideas. And, and if you're in the fog, draw multiple pictures. There's probably no one picture, one description, one explanation that quite explains the fog. So keep coming up with other explanations and, and use them to tease out uncertainty or, or questions or other points of inquiry. 
So I think being comfortable in the fog is really important. Exactly. Having strategies to work your way out of the fog is equally important. Yeah, spot on, I think. Yeah. Wait, I've looked one eye on the time. We're coming up to the end of our allotted hour. We have a, a question from a, a Sandra Valk um, and another one from Pascal Smith. So just bear in mind, we have about six minutes left. The first from Sandra Valk, my research at the Imperial College about developing methods and tools for supporting interdisciplinary collaborations. In your talk, you emphasise the importance of shared understanding and shared space, the key concept for mixed teams. In addition to these, I'd be curious to hear about processes that lead to this shared understanding or vision, particularly when there isn't a lot of time. Interesting one. Well, that's, that's a really interesting. I think you have to make the time. Uh, I'm very much an advocate of saying it's not about a shared language. It's about you being able to simultaneously translate so you understand what the other person's saying. So the biggest example for me of that was working with the Royal College of Art with Roger Coleman as a professor of inclusive design. Every time he used the word design in the first 18 months, I could have thumped him because uh -huh. I thought he was saying something stupid or wrong. And he could have thumped me many times too. Uh -huh. But eventually we got to the point we could translate. So unfortunately, I think there's no way around this, but spend time with the people, find reasons to spend time with them and generally start to understand the way they think and how that couples with the words they say. So I think the biggest mistake is to try and come up with a, a common language because each party will lose something. I think it's far better to be able to understand both languages and translate as you hear what's being said. So I think investing in that time is probably more important than anything else. And a, a shortcut to that, it's probably to be quite vigilant and say, well, what are the things I don't understand? What are the words I think I keep getting wrong? And explore them with the, with the team. Thank you very much. I remember Steve Cully saying the same about uh, needing to understand each other's language rather than try and speak the same one. I think it's very important. The, I, I, I'll make this one, unless there's something really pressing, I'll make this one the final question, if we may, from Pascal Schmidt. Looks like he's in the early phase of career at PhD at the University of Rostock. Um, I have a general question about the career of a designer. I'm interested in how you evaluate stays abroad. Should one focus on this when planning the research project or should one, one not focus on this aspect and exchange with international researchers is sufficient? Now, how important is it for, for researchers to go and actually move and embed themselves in another team? It's a really good question and I, I would focus, I think, on two things. One is what is good research process? What are the things, what are the questions you want to answer? And how will they best be answered? And if that means a trip abroad, visiting another group, then that's probably worth doing. But I wouldn't neglect what you might enjoy doing. If you think it will be fun to spend six months somewhere else and it will add some value, or at least not detract from your research, and it widens your network, that might be the right reason to go as well. So I don't think there's no reason to compel you to do one or the other, but think about yourself and think about the question you're trying to answer. And that may well give you your answer. And to be honest, we, we all take different pathways. We all have different experiences. There is no right or wrong. What's really interesting is when we get together and we talk about our different experiences, we all learn in part from the other. And I'll bring it back to healthcare again. When I talk to my anaesthetist colleagues and talk to them about how they learn from each other, they say, well, we have coffee after surgery. We each tell each other about the surgery we've just done. Mm -hmm. And therefore we each learn from that experience. So I would be delighted when meeting people to, to hear the diversity of the different things we've done. And it's not that we should try and copy, copy each other, but we just learn from each other. We learn from those experiences collectively. I think that's much more useful and important. Yeah, I, I agree. It's three minutes to go and there's nothing in the queue. So I hope all of you watching would join with me in thanking John for an excellent presentation, a very interesting discussion over the past 55 minutes. Um, I'm sure John would be happy to hear from you if you have any follow up and uh, the, the, I'm noticing there are people thanking you for it, John. Uh, I'm going to clap my hands and say thank you. Uh, thank you to the Design Society. Thank you to Ross for organising it. Thank you to all of those of you who are with us this afternoon, or if it's morning with you, morning, uh, and uh, look forward to seeing you at some other event in the future.
Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much.